where are you dude in a fucking guitar closet i'm in my, in my studio man oh shit out at your crib yeah dude when we come uh when we play nashville you gotta come out here oh dude we you know what we gotta do we gotta just record a tune one night yeah we can yeah. definitely do that. yeah man i miss you dude miss you man how you been oh you know i'm like you i'm just trying to uh make sense of the uh world you know yeah it's uh <laughs> it's been kind of weird yeah it's been weird but it's been great also it's weird it's this weird juxtapose of like holy shit the world's falling apart but good things are happening for me it's it's weird <laughs> it's good i mean hell uh i think all of us were able to make a positive out of a non yeah Hell yeah, man. Hell yeah. So, uh, you know, it's weird. I was sitting here today getting ready to interview. This is the third time I've had you on. And I thought about all the years that I've known you. And I went back through the records, man. And, you know, if I put together a set list, you have, to me, some of the best songs I've heard in the last 20 years. It's unbelievable. I start with... Uh, the the debut, you know, uh, I mean, the self-title, not the debut. The debut was Soul in Sight, but self-titled, Rita's Gone, Jealous Man, The Man You Didn't Know, Ain't Nothing Wrong With That. This fucking record's a crusher. And then you go with the Carolina Confessions, and you got Where I'm Headed, Homesick, Side Door. It's insane. And then El Dorado, you know? fucking wildflowers and wine one day she's gone next she's you know it, it, it's just tune after tune after tune for me as i was going through it and and now the new record coming out is fucking lie 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 is like a, a smasher man Dude, thank you thanks man i mean um that means a lot thank you oh i mean it's 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 wild to think about how much material you have out in the short of time that you've been out there, you know, this is what the fifth album. Yeah, technically the first three were with the band and these, uh, El Dorado and this one were, uh, solo records as it were, just cause it was different cats playing on it, you know? Right. Do you like, what is the decision? of if it's going to be a band record and a solo record so it was more it's more kind of to do with like uh the production so dan has a certain way he likes to work and with el dorado like we cut the record in about three days time and we were kind of going for that early memphis sound in a lot of ways so the best way to do that was to hire the memphis boys um Everybody on that session for El Dorado was like 80 years old, man. Yeah, I remember. Billy Sanford, his uh, second session in Nashville was Pretty Woman, and he wrote that riff for Pretty Woman. So we had him and Gene Chrisman and Bobby Wood. Bobby Wood, for sure, I know, uh, played on Suspicious Minds. But so did, so did Gene, Bubba Chrisman. So we had like all these guys that worked with Elvis Presley and um, in Dan's eyes, he's like, these are the hitters. We we had charts and we played the tunes and cut the record in three days. And, you know, when I told him my goal for this new record, Youngblood, uh, he, he knew the cats that we needed right away. So I just kind of trust the production in that in that way. It's interesting because when I uh, what made me fall in love with you is what I talked to you about um, that I love over the you know, my years of love and music is a thing that is very rare. It comes around once in a while, which would be soul rock. And when I first got into you, say the uh, self-titled record, it was very heavy soul rock. It, there's a big R&B flavor. But uh, I know that you loved rock because you guys would cover like um, war pigs and stuff, you know? Right. So and and then here we are and you're finally going for a full blown kind of uh, rock record, you know? Yeah. I think it's been a, uh, over time, it's been kind of a shipping away at the different elements of who I am musically. And there there's, 
starting to become less of an amalgamation and I'm starting to uh, focus a little bit more minutely into these certain aspects. Like El Dorado, we focused more on the balladeer kind of soul ballads and shit. And this record went kind of completely back to the roots. Um, and I mean, it was, it was a super dark time that I was living through. And this music is so uh, ingrained in me that I don't think I would have been like capable really of cutting any other kind of record. Cause this goes so deep for me. Now I do know, uh, your ex lady had no idea. I met her through you and had no idea there was any kind of turmoil. The last time you and I sat down was a couple of days before COVID we were yeah. in a hotel room. She was there. You were out writing tunes secretly for what would now become, uh, you know, young blood. And uh, no idea that there was any kind of turmoil. Was it like ongoing or was it just something that happened right away? I mean, you know, sometimes people have a hard time knowing when to call it quits. And right. If there's good elements and you're codependent, I think uh, people have a tendency to hold on to something that ain't any good for them. And, uh, I think we're both kind of doing that. She seems to be doing fine now. And uh, I'm really happy I've met the woman that I'm really in love with and we're gonna be married next year. So I'm just over the moon happy. And, you know, when I saw you, the record I was writing was really like uh, the record that I'm still working on. Wow. So I've already got 11 tunes in the can for that. And I'm going to, Italy at the end of this month to finish it. So that was like a breakup record that I was writing while I was in a relationship. And then Youngblood was like uh, kind of the end result. Right. And what, what a low place you get in. Even if it was supposed to happen, you still get in a low place after a breakup, especially if you're codependent in nature like I am. And then you find these other substances that give you temporary love the same way you were receiving it before. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I appreciate you asking about it, though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I understand the the gears, the animal of it. The door the door opened up. It was a dark hotel room. Looked like some partying was going on, you know? And that's exactly where I'd be when I was your age in, in Los Angeles, writing tunes, working with Rick Rubin. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is the this is what you're supposed to be doing. And it's not really a cliche. There is a, there's always a, a, a great little road into the dark side to find the stuff, you know, as long as you get out. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad it happened sooner than later. You know, the heavy stuff anyway. I mean, I needed to kind of uh, quit that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's what I'm saying. I don't mind. I don't, you know, I look back on my drug era and I'm like, that was fucking, you know, it's, I'm, I made it out. So it's great because you, you find things in those eras, you know? Yeah. I mean, they're creatively, uh, really good to me, you know, those dark periods, but, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm supposed to write some happy music at some point. Yeah. Yeah. I can, yeah. I can do that. Yeah. Uh, one of the greatest lines on the new record is I gave her champagne. Now she wants a limousine. It's <laughs> yeah. so fucking great because it's just like, I want more. I want more. It's yeah. oh, what, a, what a line, man. I mean, hell like that song kind of went for the throat, but I wrote most of that song while I was still in a relationship during the pandemic. I wrote, it was originally called heavy metal heart attack. And, uh, you know, uh, after the breakup, changed a few lyrics around, and that's lie, lie, lie now. But um, yeah, that one goes for the jugular a little bit more than I've ever before. But you know, it keeps me from talking shit about anybody now. Yeah, yeah. Once I get the pen to the paper, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm able to uh, put it behind me. Yeah. Let me ask you about co-writing because um, I'm not quite sure on that, on the uh, two Marcus King band records, 
were you writing all the stuff or were, has there always been some co-writers what's going on there i uh, never did any co-writing until el dorado right any any true co-writing uh soul insight there was no co-writing at all and the self-titled i co-wrote uh guitar on my hands with a buddy of mine rocky lindsley and uh he just passed away not too long ago so that's a shame but um can carolina confessions dave cobb his production style is really adding to the uh the form of the song but to my knowledge he didn't contribute anything lyrically and then el dorado is when i really did my first true co-write in nashville with dan do you enjoy the co-writing or is it um kind of you know record company influenced where they're like hey maybe get out there with some people um because my thoughts were the desmond child co-write uh hadn't heard his name since the 80s of course you know <laughs> and you know he's a hit master back then of bon jovi and all those guys aerosmith so it was uh an interesting um choice i was like wow first of all i was like oh he's still around you know oh, right uh i mean that's a great question dean i mean for me co-writing uh there's certain people that if they recommend someone i know that i probably i'm not going to enjoy it so i don't do it yeah <laughs> like if the label's pitching people to write with i'm like nah probably not uh, but that's why I'm really thankful that I kind of built my career off of like, just let me do me and I'll try to give you something good. And I've, I've kind of built my career off of that. So I just find people that I enjoy writing with and this is a great town for that. As far as Desmond, like uh, I didn't even know we were writing together until he showed up and that was a, an hour back thing. Dan, that's how Dan likes to work. Dan, he doesn't send me the schedule or anything. It's just like we're writing at 11 a.m. Tuesday and I show up and then Desmond showed up at like 1130. I didn't I wasn't aware of Desmond's track record. I wasn't I didn't know who he was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you, 24? How are you going to know? You know? Yeah, well, I was 25 was at the time. Yeah, I mean, same difference, but I'm like, uh, Good to meet you, sir. You know, and we wrote, and he's so, uh, he's a character, man. Like, he snatched my pen out of my hand because I was clicking it. I get a little fidgety. Yeah. And uh, I, I pitched a line, and then he's like, no, nah, it's corny. And Dan nearly fell out of his seat because he called me corny. He called me <laughs> corny. But I love, I love him to pieces. He's, he's really, it was a challenge uh, because he's, he's got the most hits in the room and when you're in a room with Dan Auerbach and someone's got more hits than him, you kind of got to tip your hat to, uh, the, uh, you know, yeah. the natural hierarchy there. And that's kind of what co-writing is to me. I wouldn't say that I sacrifice any of my artistic, whatever you want to call it, but it's different. It, you kind of open up different parts of your brain, but in doing so, I feel like you close other parts. Because I write songs that don't even rhyme. And like, yeah. I try to do that in like a standard Nashville co write. They'd be like, you need to smoke less pot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, I, uh, I, I wrote probably 90% of my songs, 95, I would say. So yeah. I always wondered about the co writing, what it, you know, what it's, what it's like it's such a strange animal to me. You're in a room, go <laughs> guys yeah. over there. Well, I was thinking about a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And then you are doing a little bit, and then you see what comes out of it. It's a, uh, it's a wild ride. It is, man. You really got to let your guard down. And the only way I know to do that is like every right, especially on this last record, it's always like a first date when you're meeting people for the first time, you you got to sit and get to know them for me because this was a really personal record for me. So anybody contributing on it with me, I was like, we need to get to know each other a little bit. So we'd almost have 
30 minute preamble conversation and then we'd start writing from wherever I was that day, whether I was up here or down here. And how do you do it? Is it you come in and say, well, I'm, is he helping with the lyrics or melody or, or chords or are you strumming? And he goes, oh, how about try, trying this bridge? How does that work with like a, a Desmond Child type of person? Because I, I always wondered that. Man, it's kind of a, it kind of depends on the writer. It's all kind of situationally based. Like Dan and I have a certain way that we write together, which is we guitars around the kitchen table, you know, uh, just hanging pen to paper. And uh, we bring a third party in always. And not always, but in this case we did. And we'll start strumming along and either I'll have an idea that's already kind of started or Dan will have like a melodic idea. Cause there's always something banging around in there, you know? Uh, maybe even something will start derivative of something else. And then once the lyrics kind of fall into place then it kind of becomes its own thing. There's really no set way to do it for me. It just kind of happens. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that's how it, that's how it does happen. You know, I, yeah. I was just talking to somebody last week about it, where I said, you know, I don't know, man. The jokes just come out of nowhere. And he said, "Don't they all?" And it was so <laughs> true because right. they don't they don't come from anywhere but out of nowhere. You know, and same with song lyrics. I, I talked to you about it before, but whenever I'm strumming a guitar, the chorus always seems to come out first and then I'm fucked. I'm like, oh, I got to live with this chorus. It came yeah. from nowhere and I got to figure out what the hell it means. <laughs> yeah. Especially when it's just the melody. Yeah. Uh, but song lyrics are, are interesting. Like uh, my fiance and I had a, uh, a shared note it was like a grocery list or something. And I think at some point I deleted all the groceries because I was going to get more. And then I forgot it was a shared note and I'm just writing lyric ideas in it. She's like, hey, I'm in that note still. She's like, what does any of this shit mean? I'm like, <laughs> it's the process. It doesn't make any sense right now. It'll get there. Yeah, that's yeah. great, right? bumblebees hollering you know like what is bumblebees <laughs> hollering yeah it's, <laughs> it's like fucking in the grocery yeah. notes yeah so today yeah. actually she was like what's that what the fuck does that mean <laughs> a lot of uh a lot of Les paul on the videos it, was that um on the record also yeah it was um man i think i use it on damn near every track with the exception of, you know, a couple like 12 string overdubs and my 345 was there, if anything, just for moral support. It's yeah. my security blanket guitar. So uh, I think, I think it was that, that burst of dance the whole time. Oh, wow. And what was that? Is a, a, a custom shop or a reissue or original? It's a 59 Les Paul Whoa. from Carter. And uh, I was actually thinking about buying it at one point, and uh, Dan bought it the next day. Oh, and, shit. And I put a down payment on my house. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I remember that. It's the, it was the one you played. Uh, was, was that the one you were playing with Billy Strings or something in the video? Maybe. maybe. Yeah. So, I remember going over and looking at it because... It was a pretty good deal for one. I was like, ah, think about it. Talk to my business manager. And then, uh, then the next day, Dan sent me a photo of it. And I was like, shit. Damn. Well, is, it, it. is it all straight? It's all original? Um, there's a couple funky things about it, which is why I think a collector like Dan likes it because, um, me and Dan both like kind of off the wall guitars, a little, a little funky. I don't, I mean, it's pretty true to all original. It's just not as clean as like uh, a true like vintage collector would want. Yeah, and that's why I think it was, it was a, uh, it was a good deal. But 
I used that, and I actually used an old Gibson amp for the whole record. Wow. Uh, so that's another ugly beast of a of a machinery. It's uh, it's like an old GA twenty. Somebody took out of the original chassis and put it in just like a plywood box kind of thing, and uh, <laughs> it's, it's ugly as hell. And there's a rectifier tube missing, which makes it sound even better. I think it probably pushes like. 20 watts at the most but you record oh. it's, it's beautiful oh yeah like a like a tweed deluxe yeah, yeah. yeah. so are you going to be playing les paul on the tour or on the road for this record or what's going on yeah i've been playing a lot of les paul live really what do you got i got my 69 black beauty and i've got a kind of a burst clone with a bigsby on it that i love um and I always bring my Strat and my 345 and my Tellys. Yeah. Uh, yeah, man, I got a pretty good collection that you'll you'll be seeing soon. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be interesting. You and I have talked about doing like a comedy tour for about four years. Yeah. And <clears throat> I remember we were in that hotel room right before the lockdown. And we we're like, yeah, we got to do a comedy music tour. Yeah. And then boom, the lockdown. But here we are actually going to do it. It's going to be uh, Neil Francis, myself and you and Ashlyn Kraft on some of it. Yeah. And it's going to be uh, an interesting animal. How do you see it? You know, it's like, as I see it as a comedian, you know, we look at um, the old days. I was just talking to a, uh, uh, a legend of comedy, Tom Driesen, he opened for Frank Sinatra for years. Back yeah. in the day, you know, the Blues Brothers, uh, uh, you know, all these people opened for bands in the 70s. It was just kind of easier to do and yeah. uh, kind of a cool, uh, you know, variety show vibe. But what? Do you, how do you see it, man? Yeah, I mean, it was definitely a lot more commonplace, like Robert Klein and Steely Dan. That kind of yep. stuff. Uh, and I think it's because you'd have these kind of uh, shows like the Midnight Special, where it was kind of commonplace to see a comedian and then a, in a band. So people would take that on the road. I was even talking earlier about uh, James Brown used to have a like a hype man kind of MC that yeah. was more or less like a comedian that would. Bobby Bird? It wasn't Bobby Bird. It was another cat. He was kind of more of a one liner type of dude. Wow. But, um, yeah, I mean, you, I thought about first, like when we met, I was like, Dean's a great comedian and he's a rock and roll singer. So he knows how to, he knows how to maneuver a, a rock and roll crowd. Yeah. But you're the first guy that came to mind, like having a more soft-spoken comedian would have been, it could have been a train wreck, but I think you know how to really, you know, wrangle them. Yeah. And also not sneaking it up on anybody. It's pretty clear on the poster and the ticket that there's comedy involved. So, I mean, we're going to see how it goes. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, I know I've, I've done it before and it's, um, yeah, you I, did the Queens of the stone age, right? I did it with Alice in Chains for two weeks. Okay. And, that's then, right. I, and then I just recently did it with Metallica, which was like fucking <laughs> really hard. I bet. <laughs> Cause they, it was their 40 year anniversary. So yeah. I went out there ready with these jokes. And then I realized, wait a minute, we got Ecuador in the house. We got Brazil. We yeah. have, uh, you know, uh, you know, people from all around the world that aren't, they don't, they don't know comedy or, 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 you know, local references or any, I'm riffing on, uh, the burritos that we had fight over in San Francisco. And they're like, what, what is this guy talking about? But, <laughs> I you think really it, niche San Francisco humor. <laughs> well, it was their 40 year and we were in San Fran. That's funny. It, it was a special party for that. And I was just talking about like how people, you know, when it comes to Metallica, they just they argue over Metallica like they do a burrito, like, oh, after Cliff Burton died, they're fucking done. And then the other guys would be like, after they cut their hair, they're fucking done. And, right. you know, <laughs> after this, some kind of monster uh, 
you know, psychiatrists there, they're done. And it's like, they've never been done. They've been doing arenas their entire lives. You fucking idiots, you know? So that was kind of the, the gist of the bit. Oh. And, um, you know, I think as a comedian, you have to find it and, and have fun with it. Uh, I think if the rooms are seated, like the Ryman, it'll be fantastic because they're seated. And the ones where they're standing up, that's really where you got to figure it out because they're just walking around with their beers. Like, hey, why's that roadie talking? You know, <laughs> like, you yeah, know what I mean? I'm hoping we can maybe kind of, you know, limit the number of shows we have to do with, with standing. Yeah. There's some places you can't avoid it, but of course, I'm going to be great. I mean, I just saw a comedy. Um, it was an outstanding lineup, actually. Uh, Kid Rock's comedy thing. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yep. with my, my my boy Chris Porter and uh, yeah. and Darnell Rawlings and uh, yeah, Shane Gillis was there and yeah. Big Jay Ogerson, uh Theo Vaughn dropped in and did a guest appearance. Um, Ch uh, Chase Willie was there. He's yeah, badass. yeah, yeah. I mean, you're you're a big comedy fan, you know. So I love it. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Well, I, the way I see it, I think at the end of the night, the encore, we got to do one each night. Yeah. Now we've been talking about this. I mean, oh, we got we to gotta think of something. Well, we go. I think we go from Earth, Wind and Fire one night to ACDC to yeah. Prince to fucking Skinner, whatever, you know? I mean, I'm down. We got a lot of miles between here and there to start drumming up some ideas. Yeah. yeah. You're, right, you're riding on my bus, so that'll be... That'll be even more fun. I can't even wait, dude. <laughs> I mean, I really can't wait, dude. It's uh it's really it was a really, really tough time of not working. Um, at least you could make records, but comedians couldn't really do anything. And I truly thought that it was probably over for me, you know? Cause I thought, well, are we ever going to get back to live comedy in a room with people? It just didn't seem like it for a long time. And it got really dark. And then to get the call from you guys, I was just kind of like, wow. And then, you know, to do the Bill Burr Arena tour, those two things are fucking life changing. They're like the greatest things ever to happen in my life. You know, it's like, wow, I'm doing a rock tour on a bus. I haven't been on a rock tour since 2006 when I played music. Right. You know, so I'm going back out on the bus with some young dudes that don't they don't, they don't need sleep. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody said to me, they go, hey, you know, Marcus and his band, they're young dudes. I go, yeah. And he goes, you remember when you were young on a bus? You didn't sleep. And I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm fired up for it, man. Man, I, I sleep with the best of them. So, yeah, <laughs> we we kind of. That first week is going to be pretty restless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then it just kind of eases in, you know, papers, but, uh, it's going to be such a fun tour, man. The band, like I, I, we were texting about it the other day. The band's really firing on all cylinders, man. It's going to be God. fun. That's so great. Now you're yeah. going out seven piece, right? Yeah. Seven piece, And you got a rhythm guy now, Drew. Yeah. Drew Smithers. Yeah. Smithereens. That's so cool, man. Um, somebody hit me up. They knew him. They, oh, I know. Um, uh, Jakir King. He's a producer in Nashville. Yep. Uh, big dude. Great. He did my record. He's one of my favorite humans ever. He worked with Tom Waits and, you know, he did all those big Kings of Leon records. But he hit me and he's like, yeah, I guess his wife or whatever is uh, her best friend. That's Drew's man or what i don't know what it is but he's like wow this is like a, a small world you know yeah it is a small world i i uh i've heard drew talk about jakir yeah. a lot they're good friends but uh drew's a great player and it's just you know this tour is really a full circle one too because me and drew been talking about playing together for like four years five years like you and i i mean he's been a good buddy of mine for a long time and uh he was in a group called Bishop Gun. Oh yeah, and they had a song called Shine, and that's a, uh, you know, this past weekend was Theo Vaughn. That's his opening track. So if you want to hear Drew, <laughs> you know, check that podcast out. But 
he's such a great player and he's so uh gracious and humble and just that's what we call him drucifer on the bus because he's so nice uh so it's like such a misnomer but uh yeah the rest of the band we got the two horns and there's a lot of like sneaky percussion on this record uh the new one so my sax player is an amazing conga player and my trumpet player is like a world-class tambourine player wow. he does like middle eastern rhythms on the tambourine it's outstanding and so they're playing auxiliary percussion and we got the we got the real hammond organ and big fat drums it's just sounds huge man man i i can't even wait and are are you going out with the orange amps yeah yeah these, these custom cabs they built for me man it's uh man there's like eight 10 inch speakers in them and i got two of those and then i got two 15s and a fender dual showman head so it's gonna be massive the whole stage setup is reminiscent of like uh you know the original almond brothers lineup oh god kind of like big amps at the back of the risers so everything's really big and we want the amps to move a lot of the room and uh you know at the vegan theater a lot of these places are just perfect for this the fox in atlanta uh or we're at the tabernacle but that's still it's gonna yeah. be perfect. yeah oh man i I'm did that yeah I did the Fox in Atlanta with Burr recently. And all you think about is Skinner, you know, just play it pretty for Atlanta, you know? And yes, yeah. you know, for, what they told me was the building was going to get torn down. And Skinner said, look, we'll come in there and play like three nights and give you all the money, keep this building together. And they did. Yeah. And then they put out one of the greatest fucking live records ever. That's a damn good live record, man. Come on, dude. The way it opens, we're going to welcome back some very old friends of ours, Leonard Skinner. And then they just kick into working for MCA. Come on, dude. It's outrageous. I mean, you're one of the only cats that uh, claims to be a Skinner fan. Oh. I feel like a lot of people feel like it almost, uh, it's like wearing a MAGA hat to be a Skinner fan. Well, <laughs> That's 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 ridiculous because you know One of the greatest rock and roll groups of all time <laughs> to me. You to watch that Skinner doc and they just get up at like eight and go down to that fucking boiling hot shack yeah. and play for ten hours a day because that's what they do. Almond Brothers, same thing. You know, we play music. That's what we do. Yeah, it's uh, it's really one of those kind of documentaries where you want to get up and work it's like i'm kind of, i've been working on something with paul riddle from the marshall tucker band oh wow he's, he's another one uh they always called it getting suited up and really going to work uh tommy caldwell the original bass player from that band he passed away in 1980 in a car accident but uh that was always his thing was man whatever day of the week it is it's a tuesday night in omaha it's cold as hell you want to go home but that's somebody's saturday night out there and they saved their money up or whatever and spent money to come see you so what a sack of shit you must be to go out there and give them a subpar show you go out there and give them their money's worth it's true man because they paid for a babysitter gas yeah, that's I've their saturday that. night yeah you're in omaha on a tuesday they moved their week around to see you. So it's a selling out a, you know, middle of nowhere town in the middle of the week. That always means so much more to me than selling out LA on a Saturday. Oh yeah. Like, well, wow. you, know, you know what I say <laughs> I tomorrow, every yeah. night that I go on stage is like Christmas and a Saturday night. It's a dream come true every night. I never even, I never take it for granted. I'm like, I'm fucking going on stage again. I'm not swinging a hammer at 7:30 yeah. in the morning, you know. It's a blessing, man. It really is. And that being said, you know, there's always moments that you don't enjoy, like yeah. long flights and missing your loved ones, missing birthdays. Uh, it's like that Dewey Cox thing. It's like, hell, I'm gonna miss some births. Period. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm gonna be home every time you have a baby. <laughs> really, 
they kind of nailed it <laughs> with that. Let me ask you something a little bit about how the Rick Rubin thing came up. Um, yeah. Does he approach you? And have you talked about him ever producing a record? Uh, Rick Rubin being my all time favorite uh, in the history of the records that he put out and the diversity of it is just unreal. And his knowledge of music and his love of music is definitely a guy I would want to work with. And, um, you know, it's, it's just insane. So how, does he find you and reach out to you one day? What happens here? Yeah, man. I, I just keep counting my lucky stars because everyone I've ever worked with, that's, that's kind of how it's happened. I, I kind of put my nose down to the grindstone and just keep working. And, uh, yeah, just one day I get a call out of the blue and, you know, uh there he is rick rubin so wow uh, and what's uh, he say to you like hey man you into robin trower you know because because i know rubin's gonna come at you like what if we did a three-piece cream style record or what, what how does it happen well he's just like <clears throat> like you said like you mentioned he's such a such a fan of music and he has so much reverence for it <clears throat> we started off talking because he saw me do uh my tune goodbye carolina at the grand old opry so he saw that and he was really taken with the video so he called me and at that time i was kind of shopping a new uh publishing company and uh, i was kind of in between labels as well so the timing was really serendipitous he kind of scooped in uh and we started working together right away or we started hanging together um what were those hangs like man they're so peaceful <laughs> yeah. rick's just like such a laid-back dude and uh we just hang and listen to music and no shoes it's a very zen place um just really rad dude and we just Out talk there at shangri-la yeah shangri-la so we just talk music for hours and listen to music i played them all my demos uh, and he liked all the demos. And then I went out there and just worked and wrote, just kind of locked myself up at Shangri-La and wrote for a couple of weeks. And, you know, it, it ended up uh, being that I, I saved those tunes. But so you won't hear any of those songs, unfortunately, on the new record. But uh, the one I'm currently working on, that's where you'll hear those songs. Is he going to produce the one that one? Well, I don't. <laughs> I don't know what I'm what I'm supposed to say or not say, but uh, right. Like I said, there's a record in the works. Yeah, I remember when you first told me that you were out there working with Ruben, and we we're in the hotel room. I was like, Ah, Marcus is living my dream right now. It's fucking <laughs> great. That is awesome. There's no, to me. I remember uh i went to ruben's house and played like five songs for him you know like towards the end of my music run i was there somebody hooked up a meeting i went to his house it was like 10 at night and it was right by the comedy store and we were just looking down la cienega and he was in this room i could see these dixie chicks photos behind him and he just closed his eyes he's like let me let me hear a few and I was just, uh, dude, I'm playing acoustic guitar and singing to Rick Rubin, no one around in his like chill room. And he's all, that's real nice, man. Let's hear another one. You know, <laughs> I played like five and put the guitar in the case and drove down the hill and never heard from him again. But I was like, well, I got to do that. You know, that's a hell of an experience. It's always really uh, nerve wracking to play for him like that. Oh, and Rick's really, you know, he's a really chill dude. He'll just lay down <laughs> and listen totally. to it. I've never seen a person absorb a song quite the way that he does. Feels It's like he he pulls it in from every part of his body, his whole being. He's absorbing everything that you're offering. So I take his word uh, like gold standard for me. He's um, He's 
he's a tough critic, but when he likes something, it really makes you feel like a million bucks. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. His track record's ridiculous. You know? Yeah, that it is. <laughs> and his, and his, uh, the music he loves uh, is impeccable, you know, and everything he's worked with. I don't care what you think. It's like, you know, Dixie chicks fire. Then you go, uh, Oh, Beastie Boy, you know, uh, Run DMC. Then, then you go, you know, Johnny Cash. You're just all over the place. And it's all good. Yeah, so it's, it's always good, man. I mean, he'll send me to like jam sessions. Like while I was out there, he sent me to this jam session to just hang out and play. And like Mike D was on the drums. <laughs> Whoa, really? Yes. Just the kind of shit that you get yourself into out there you're like i don't know it's mind-boggling <laughs> there was a moment where you thought about moving to la is that still in your head uh I, I mean man i still love the south and the, the singing trees but um i think the goal now is to have a place out there yeah have both yeah. right yeah I'd love, I'd love to have both um I mean, that's the ambitious side of me, but maybe one day. Yeah. I'm the same way, man. I think, okay. LA and New York, six yeah. weeks here, six weeks there, back and forth. You know, I think you and I are similar. We have similar style and like architecture too. Oh, so uh, it's a lot cheaper to get a Frank Lloyd Wright style house, you know, in South Carolina. You're right. Los Angeles. You know what? You're so right, man. I mean, I follow that uh, cheap or mid-century finds. Yeah, I always see you on there. I'm yeah, like, yeah, on Instagram. And I'm like, damn, fuck, yeah. look at that. Yeah. You know, somebody told me something interesting, though, Marcus. They said, look, um, you know, you move somewhere for the architecture. And he goes, uh, and then I'll tell you this. After six months, the architecture wears off. And you realize you live, you live in like, you know, somewhere like Fresno, you know, <laughs> and he said that to me and it was kind of a nugget that I took and was like, you know, you're right. You know, it's, uh, you gotta, you, once you're in your house, you gotta love what's around you also, you know? Yeah. I mean, that was, that was what led me out in my neck of the woods. I, I was like, what's behind me? It's all trees. So I'm like, what's back there? Who owns that property? What is this? Because I don't want any condos sneaking up on me. Right. So I'm like, bird sanctuary. Boom. Let's buy it. Yeah. Well, like, there's a bald eagle back there. As long as he's hanging out, I'm, I don't have to worry about condos. So it <laughs> makes me happy. <laughs> bald eagle bird sanctuary total win man i know oh, America, man the bald eagle saves me again baby yeah <laughs> hell yeah hell yeah okay so the record comes out uh august what august 26th oh my god and then we start the tour september i believe 8th or something yeah that sounds right yeah uh, and then we go from like the october 28th or something man it's it's gonna be great yeah dude um and i've i've got some other gigs after that too yeah where uh, are you going well i'm going out to uh i'm actually going to new york i don't know if i can say it yet maybe by the time this comes out i'm gonna go jam with uh phil lesh and the boys at the oh camp. fucking rad is that for the halloween yeah so you should just ride up to you know oh, oh. with me <laughs> oh, I'm doing that for sure, buddy. <laughs> I, I ain't missing that, man. Uh, what's that venue called? The famous one they played for years? Capitol Theater. Yeah, oh, man. Come on, dude. I'm down with that. My buddy uh, Shapiro, he owns it now since 2012. And oh. uh, he's the best guy to own it, man. He's killer, dude. That's so great. And then what do you got after that? A Europe tour or anything? Oh, you just got back from Europe, right? Yeah, we did. Uh, we had some Europe dates on the in the works for uh, November, December, but we ended up uh, rescheduling that tour to the spring, and it just worked out better for for routing over there. 
and November, I'm just going to be off. I'm going to spend a few weeks uh, just getting right internally, doing a little self check in. Um, be good. That's great. That's great. And then, uh, and then you're going to be married, man. Wild. Yeah, then I'm going to be a married man. It's going to be great. Uh -huh. I love it. I, you know, I came from a broken family, so yeah, I always wanted to be a, a husband and a dad. I just want to, I mean, my dad is my best friend. He's going to be my best man, actually. Wow. Uh, but he was such a good parent, but you know, there's some not so good ones out there and I just have always wanted to be a, a dad and a husband. So I'm excited about that. I've been there, man. I've been there, you know, the bad, the bad, uh, the bad upbringing, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, what was it? Dan Soder had a whole bit about like coming from a shitty upbringing, alcoholic dad. It's like, <laughs> you know, you don't think I'm up here because things went well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the thing, man. I was I was telling someone recently, like, I've never met like a successful comedian that was like family was incredible. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Musicians, no, nobody's Thanks. saying that. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, it's uh, a bumpy upbringing. Uh, I I wouldn't trade for anything because uh, right. everything I got no regrets. Everything I've done has just been, uh, you know, I just love it. You know. It's yeah. the drive. It is. It creates that drive. And I'm I'm thankful for it, man. Thankful as hell. Because it's funny, like in school, I knew kids who just like phenomenal pianists played like circles around everybody else. And he's like, nah, I like running track and I'm gonna go to school for law or become a doctor, something more you know, sustainable. I'm like, Oh yeah, your parents are great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Right. Yeah. And we do need doctors. So I'm like, good. Thank God we're not all lunatics. Oh, can you imagine the entire earth of artists? Nothing would get done. Dude, I got rehearsal. <laughs> well, not a lot will get done, but I'm, I'm thankful. Yeah. You know. I'm, I'm looking forward to the tour, man. I cannot wait. And, and congrats on everything because, you know, um, I was talking to all them witches yesterday, Robbie. And you know, Love them guys. yeah, your management, these guys and you, your work ethic and everything, you, you know, we're doing double nights everywhere, double Ryman's double tabernacles, you know, these are double beacons. This is a, uh, a, 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 if we would have done the tour when we were first talking about it, we'd be troubadours across the U S yeah. which, which would have been fun, but this is going to be like pretty rad. I mean, they're pretty monumental venues and some we're returning to for and or some we're returning back to and some we're doing for the first time. So our our management and our agency have really just created this whole plan of just like circling the states and circling the uh, <laughs> what's going on. We just adopted a kitten. So oh. kitten, kitten just got here. Oh, um, let's see. All right. Yeah, let's see. Kit. Yeah. <clears throat> Which one is this? This is Fritter. This is Fritter. Fritter. Oh, hey. <laughs> Apple Fritter. Now, this is quality content. Yeah, yeah. Cat, cat content. <laughs> oh my goodness. Hi. Wow, that's that's great. Fritter. Hey, oh, Fritter. Zip. Oh, zip. Oh, you got two. We Whoa. got two kittens. Wow. Oh my, <laughs> oh my god, they're already doing interviews. Hey guys, they're already famous. Yeah, yeah. Get that Instagram going for them. Uh oh that's cool. Oh. Yeah. No oh, well, man. Hopefully they'll be on the road with us. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of bringing my Gert, my dog, my French bulldog. The, the oh, your Frenchie is so cool. I know, right, Gertrude? It's a great name, too. I know. That's my grandma's name. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh God, I love that name, Gertie. Trudy, baby. I love <laughs> Trudy on the telephone. <laughs> well, yeah. hey man, I'm I'm really looking forward to it. And a shout out to our mutual buddy over there, the old banker guitars. Uh, yeah, 
Yeah, fucking I love him, man. And uh and and I'm looking forward to you know, it'll be fun to do comedy and live a little bit of the old rock and roll dream, you know, each night. <laughs> oh yeah. That's Get up good. there and sing one, something, you know. Yeah. We'll put you to work, man. It's gonna be good. Oh, I'm fucking ready, dude. <laughs> You don't even know. I'm fired. I got goosebumps right now. I'm fired up, man. Yeah, man. Me too, bro. It's going to be fun. I love you, dude. And I love this record. This record is fantastic. It comes out here in a few weeks, everybody. Uh, there's some great videos on um, YouTube, four live videos of them playing the uh, four of the songs that are out right now. And uh, man, that lie, 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 it's just killer to me, man. Oh. Thank you, dude. Thank Just you. a smoker. I'm telling you, man, you definitely you, the rival sons, hound mouth, these bands, that's just these bands that I'm just completely in love with that, you know, are newer bands from the last 15 years. And they're just some of the best music I've heard in years. And that's high praise to be compared to all them boys. Um, there's, there's a lot of good music out there and, Thankful to folks like you who, who search it out and find it and share it with us. Oh, yeah. I've been shouting you out for five years, man. You know? You're like, you're like that buddy that everybody has that tells them about good music, but you do it on a larger scale. So we're all yeah. thankful to you for that. Oh, I love you, man. And you know that. I it was you, bro. great, a great, great times we've had. I, and uh, I will see you in a, a, in a month, man. I see you on the bus, bro. Be careful out there. <laughs> I can't wait, man. I'll see you, buddy. All right, man. Cheers. All right, thank you. See ya.